Hi everybody and welcome to the latest vodcast for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School. I'm Mr. Galladay and today we're going to be talking about the history of this idea of biological evolution by the process of natural selection as it was for first proposed by Charles Darwin back in 1859. Uh, this is a good place to update the organization in your notebook, and here we go. Uh, Darwin was born in 1809 in, in England. Uh, he was, uh, as you can see in this picture, from an early age, he was a passionate uh, nature student. Uh, he was interested in plants and animals of all types, uh, and uh, tried to earn a degree uh, as a medical doctor to father follow in his father's footsteps, uh, was unsuccessful at that for a variety of reasons, uh, primarily the fact that uh, his heart just was not in it. Um, he ended up getting a, a degree in 1831, uh, was intending to pursue a career as a clergyman, and uh, was offered a position on board a ship which was uh, commissioned to travel around the world, uh, mapping the coast of South America and other uh, exotic locations. Uh, Darwin being interested in natural history and uh, all sorts of plants and animals of course jumped at the chance uh, and on this voyage uh, saw all kinds of things uh, that influenced his thinking uh, and basically had a, a huge influence on uh, his life's work and, and for the rest of his life. Um, the Voyage of the Beagle uh, started in England, went around the coast of South uh, America, and then spent a great deal of time right around here in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, and this is the location where uh, a lot of uh, things that he saw there, the, the variation of, of species on the islands are what had a huge impact on his ideas. Uh, when he returned to England, he spent the next 22 years uh, the idea had sort of started in the back of his mind uh, and well actually probably in the front of his mind I'm sure and he uh, spent a great deal of time um, trying to convince himself that he was correct um, he was a devout Christian at this time in his life uh, and was very well aware that this theory or this idea would uh, plunge him into a great deal of controversy which he was reluctant to do unless he was absolutely convinced that he was correct. Um, he continued to uh, work and to study and to gather more data. He received a letter in 1858 uh, that really kind of pushed him to publish uh, at that time. This gentleman, Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, was working in Southeast Asia uh, and really came to the same ideas as Darwin did. Uh, sent Darwin this letter saying, well, here's my idea. I'm thinking of calling it natural selection. What do you think? Uh, well, since Darwin had spent the last 22 years working on this idea, uh, he was uh, rather distressed, to put it mildly. Um, and, uh, well, among other things, you can see that Russell Wallace had, uh, well, he just had a cooler beard uh, than Darwin did at that point in time. So uh, here's Darwin with his mutton chop sideburns versus uh, Wallace with his full bushy beard. And uh, Darwin uh, felt very honored bound uh, in the English tradition to, to uh, share discovery or, or share credit at the time. Uh, Darwin and Wallace's papers were both presented at the same time in, in London. Uh, and then the following year, Darwin published uh, The Origin of Species, which was his, uh, his first book on the topic of, uh, of evolution by natural selection. Uh, as time went on, we, we remember Darwin as the, uh, the originator of the theory, uh, even though he and uh, Wallace both developed the idea at the same time. Uh, because really Darwin had, had put much more work into it and, and really uh, the, the degree of proof that he had in the idea uh, was, was much greater than, uh, than Wallace's. And by the time they were old men, as you can see, Darwin had a beard that was every bit as cool as Wallace's. So that pretty much put the whole thing to bed. Okay, well, 
uh, what we want to talk about here really is the lines of evidence that Darwin had at the time. And he drew his evidence from four main areas. Uh, the fossil record, the geographic distribution of li living species, and we'll talk about each of these in some detail in a little bit, homologous body structures, and similarities in embryology. And so these are the four main lines of evidence that Darwin had at, in 1859. Now, since then, we have uh, a number of other lines of evidence that have supported this that were basically not available to Darwin because they hadn't been discovered yet. Okay, first of all, the fossil record. Well, the fossil record shows um, a number of things that uh, support this idea of, of evolution. First of all, uh, our earliest fossils of living things go back about 3.4 billion years. Uh, and one of the things that was known at Darwin's time is that we had had these periods of mass extinctions in Earth's history. Um, and so, it, it, to the extent that about 99% of all living things that have ever uh, lived on planet Earth are no longer uh, living, they're, they're extinct. Um, most species have gone extinct at, uh, during these different times. So you see one back here uh, after the Ordovician, 75% uh, became extinct. So species that we see up until this point go away and are never seen again. 60% uh, of the species that were present at this time, uh, after, after this uh, this period in time go extinct, they're never seen again. 90% go extinct, the Permian extinctions were huge. 90% of all living things that were present at this time go extinct and are never seen again. 70% of all living things in the Triassic. Um, so you, you see these periods of, uh, of extinction that were just massive and obviously we have lots of species here uh, so this would suggest that something is going on. Um, the other thing that, that we know from the fossil record is that the Earth has is not uh, always been in the same condition that we see today. Uh, dramatic changes have happened, uh, occurred to the environments uh, on planet Earth, uh, and so it is only reasonable to expect that living things have adapted to, uh, to keep up with that change. Living things, we, we can tell from the fossil record, have gone through dramatic changes um, as these environmental conditions have changed throughout the planet. Okay, next thing that, uh, next line of evidence is what we call geographic distribution of species. Basically what that means is um, where are species and how are they similar to, uh, how are they similar or different from other species that live in uh, other nearby locations. Well, one of the things that Darwin saw on the Galapagos was that on different islands there were lots of species that were very similar but not identical to species both on neighboring islands and also on the mainland. Here you can see some tortoise shells uh, and you can tell by looking at these that they are similar but not identical. Um, and Darwin saw this not only with the tortoises but also the birds, lizards, a uh, number of different plants and animals on the on the various islands that were very similar but not identical to the other islands and also to the mainland of South America. Um, here we see uh, a little more detail of the uh, of the tortoise shells, uh, and here's a diagram showing the uh, a little bit more of the bodies of of what some of these tortoises look like. And as you can see, they look very similar but they're not identical. They are adapted to the unique species of plants that are present on the islands where they lived. Um, not only the tortoises, but also these species of finches that were uniquely ad adapted uh, to feed on the various types of seeds and insects that were present um, on the different islands within the Galapagos. Okay, so that is what we mean by geographic distribution of species. The fourth, or the, I'm sorry, the third uh, line of evidence is what we call homologous body structures. Uh, and that is uh, illustrated rather nicely in this diagram. What we mean by homologous body structures are, is organs or features that are similar uh, in structure but have different functions. And if you look at the uh, arm of a human, the front leg of a dog, the front leg of a horse, the wing of a bird, and the wing of a bat, um, they have the same basic structures, the same basic bones are there, uh, but obviously they are adapted for very different types of uses. Um, 
when we look at all sorts of living things, we see similar body plans, similar structures that suggest a common origin. Um, here is some details of the um, uh, of these um, six different uh, animals, which all have the same basic bone structure. So this is the well. If we look at the human, this is the humerus, the, which is your upper arm bone, um, and we see the same structure in in a dolphin flipper. Uh, in the leg of a turtle, uh, in the leg of a horse, in the wing of a bird, in this case a chicken, and also in the wing of a bat. Now we see the same types of bone structures, the same bones are there, but obviously they, they have been adapted uh, for very different uses, for very different functions. Um, so another thing that is, is uh, present in different organs of, of different living things are what we call vestigial organs. Vestigial organs are organs that suggest some evolutionary change in the past uh, because they typically don't have any known function at the time. Um, one example is the pelvis in a whale. If you look at uh, the skeleton of a whale, uh, you can see that in fact they have a, uh, a pelvis or a hip bone with a greatly reduced uh, femur, which is the upper leg bone. Obviously, whales don't have legs, um, but this does suggest uh, that they evolved from land animals, which we now have pretty, uh, very strong fossil evidence as well as DNA evidence to suggest that that is the case. In addition, uh, snakes also have the same sorts of structures. They have a hip bone and a femur, um, even though they don't have legs. Uh, so the they don't have any external legs, but the bone structure is still there. It's greatly reduced and serves no structure. Um, humans, in fact, have a, a, a little thing called the appendix, which is uh, right at the location where the small intestine and large intestine come together. Uh, and in us, it serves no known function. However, there are other animals in which uh, this the appendix does serve a function. So here it is in a rabbit. Uh, in rabbits, it serves to house beneficial bacteria that are able to break down cellulose in plants, uh, and so they can use that as a source of energy. So there are animals in which this is a very useful structure, uh, but the fact that it's there in us but greatly reduced suggests a common evolutionary past. Okay, and then our fourth line of evidence is comparative embryology. Um, now, what is known is that embryonic uh, embryos develop in the same sequence in similar patterns. So if you look at these uh, six different embryos here at this early stage, uh, they all look very similar. And as they go through their development, they will uh, take on different forms as they, as they progress. Now, the ones that are the most closely related, for example, the fish and the, uh, and the um, salamander, which is an amphibian, they are the most similar, and so they, they're the most closely related. And so they, it's not surprising that they, uh, as they progress, that they look uh, the most similar for the longest period of time. Um, two mammals, a rabbit and a human, again, look the most similar for the longest period of time. Uh, but this fact that they uh, go through similar patterns of, um, of development suggests a common evolutionary past. As I said, mo the species that are more closely related uh, share these development patterns for a longer period of time. Um, modern genetics has now shown that, these, uh, that we have common genes which control our development. Uh, and so even though we are not that closely related to uh, reptiles, amphibians, or fish, uh, we have many of the same types of genes that control our development during these, uh, these uh, early developmental stages. Now, I want to be clear about this. This is not the same. Uh, there was a fellow that came along later that, that suggested that um, as we develop that we go through our, we, we sort of uh, recapitulate or relive our evolutionary past. That is not what this is saying at all. Uh, that idea has been discredited and shown to be false. Um, but what this does show is that closely related organisms or closely related species have similar development patterns um, 
going from the uh, fertilized egg up until the point at, at which they um, are, are fully formed. Okay, so let's look at a, a just a quick summary of, of what Darwin's theory is. Um, and first of all, there are three main ob observations that, uh, that all this is based on. And some of these we have, have talked about uh, in earlier vodcasts and, and in class. Uh, first of all, we know that individuals in a population have variation, uh, and much of that variation is inheritable. Uh, also, organisms all can produce more offspring than can survive. That is to say that uh, any population can produce a higher rate of offspring than the environment can support. Uh, and so since this is the case, uh, the re resources are limited, whether those resources are food or shelter or water or space, uh, there is limited resources. So it follows then from this that individuals that are best suited to the environment are the ones that are going to survive. Those are the ones that are going to pass their, their traits on to their offspring. Okay. Um, after uh, over a long periods of time, uh, those individuals can have an effect on the population. This is important. Natural selection causes changes to the characteristics of a population. It does not ch cause changes in characteristics to an individual, only to a population. Um, and so the sixth thing, which is an inference which, we, which follows from uh, the earlier observations, is that all species alive today have descended with modification from different species that lived in the past. Okay, so here are some review questions that I'd like you to answer on the left-hand side of your notebook. Uh, this will give you a little bit of a review of the uh, concepts that we've just talked about. And this is going to wrap it up for this podcast. I'm Mr. Galladay for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School, and I hope you have a great day.